For those who may not know me, my name is Jerem Johnson. I am the President and CEO of Assembly for the Arts. And before we get started, I want to acknowledge uh, our forebears and the native peoples on whom land, on whose land we are right now, and to acknowledge them uh, and their part of where we are today. I'd also like to acknowledge our partners, of course, we here on the campus of Cleveland Clinic and Case Western Reserve University, and our major partnering institutions, our co-presenters, Front International, Assembly for the Arts, and Case Western Reserve University. It's not lost on me that uh, you all picked a beautiful day on a fall Saturday where you could be just about anywhere. Uh, with your loved ones at many events uh, happening across our region, so we thank you for, for your sacrifice today. But I really believe the sacrifice is going to be worth it. Um, the seeds we're planting today, they are planted in the soil that has been cultivated for some time. Assembly for the Arts, we are an arts council. Uh, some of you may know us from our former uh, uh, institution is Arts Cleveland or CPAC, but we are a new organization a year and two months old with a new board and a mission for two things, to expand the pie of resources for our arts and culture industry and to increase equity within that industry. And that gets to why we're here today. Um, the questions we ask today, we're going to ask them again in three years at the next Front Triennial. But along the way to that three-year triennial, three years hence, Assembly for the Arts will be working with all of our partners to be working in tangent and in partnership and empowerment, and more about that a little bit later. Um, I want to introduce our speakers and our moderator, and I'm going to be wanting to thank the staff who helped us make today possible. You're going to hear from Fred, Fred Bidwell a bit later, but one of the key architects and curators today was none other than Deirdre McPherson. Raise your hand, Deirdre. We want to thank Deirdre for her leadership as uh, a major community convener and arts champion. Also, just staffers working with us, our staff at Assembly, uh, I know, and also our, our consultant working with us, Susan Shear, who's in the room. All right, let's get off to, to the bios. Um, let me start with, those are my bios here, and you do have in front of you our order of programming. And let me also just, I'll point out bookkeeping here or housekeeping. We're going to begin this morning with our panel discussion, we're going to break for lunch, and then we're going to come back with another panel slash discussion with a whole new group of community leaders, arts, champions. But first this morning, we have some of our major arts institutions. Um, and let me turn you to my page. Moderating this morning is Jennifer Coleman. Uh, when I came to Cleveland a year and two months ago, she welcomed me with open arms and really sort of gave me the, the nitty gritty of what's happening What's happening now in our great city as I return to here after 35 years? She is the Foundation Program Director for Creative Culture and Arts for the, the George Gunn Foundation. Prior to joining the Foundation, Jennifer Coleman was an architect. Uh, she was president of her own design firm, Jennifer Coleman Creative. Earlier in her career, she practiced architecture at several local architecture firms. She has founded CityProud.com, a company that produced audio walking tours of Cleveland that highlight the distinctive history and architecture of Cleveland. Among her many civic endeavors, she served as chair of the Cleveland Landmarks Commission, the Downtown Flats Design Review Committee, and the Group Plan Commission. She's been a member of the Board of Trustees of many local arts and cultural organizations. She received her Bachelor of Architecture degree from Cornell University. And I will say, if you want to know, really the ins and outs, and where we, we're going, where we ought to be going. She is a wonderful thought partner. I thank her for that. I'm going to go next to Fred Bidwell. Um, Fred is an entrepreneur, philanthropist, and collector. After graduating from Oberlin College with an art history major, he worked as a commercial and fine arts photographer before changing his career to advertising. 
and I can't read this entire bio because it, it, I encourage you to read it, but I can tell you that he is one of the most serious people about investing and supporting the promotion of arts and culture across all sectors of our, our communities. Um, I'm proud to call him the chair of the assembly board, uh, the chair of front. Um, you all may know that in addition to serving as a uh, trustee and member of the executive committee of the Cleveland Museum of Art, he was interim and director and CEO of the museum in 2014. He serves on the boards of Cleveland Neighborhood Progress, the Cleveland Foundation, and is board chair, of course, of Assembly for the Arts. Uh, in August of 2016, he announced the, the launch of Front International, and here we are, four years later, at the second iteration of Front. Um, and we're pre pleased to have him. You can hear from him shortly. John Fumey is here. He is um, the board of directors at the Akron Art Museum, appointed John Fumey as its new John S. Knight director and CEO. Akron Art Museum, uh, that happened in 2022. Fumey is a former board trustee and has served as the interim director at the Akron Art Museum since May 2020. He's an active member of Akron's civic and arts community. He brings over 25 years of leadership and support in arts and culture, having served 10 years of service on, as a trustee on the Akron Art Museum Board of Directors, and also as a founding board member and former vice president and board of trustees member of Arts Now. He has served on the City of Akron Public Art Program and Leadership Akron um, and as an as official member of the Arts Advancement Council of the University of Akron. He serves on several boards. I encourage you to look at his, uh, his information, his bio as well. I'm really thrilled to have him here. Of course, the Front Triennial is happening in three cities here in Cleveland, in Oberlin, and also in Akron. I encourage you to get to Akron to see those fabulous works there, uh, some of which are at the Akron Art Museum as well. Welcome, John. Bill Griswold. William M. Griswold was appointed director of the Cleveland Museum of Art in May 2014. He was the institution's ninth director. He leads a 450 member team responsible for building, preserving, and displaying and interpreting the museum's renowned collection of some 60,000 works of art. For deepening its long standing engagement with the local community and for elevating its profile and reputation both nationally and internationally. Shortly after his arrival in Cleveland, Griswold led the museum's preparations for the celebration of its centennial in 2016, and he oversaw the conclusion of a $320 million campaign that made possible its recently completed renovation and expansion uh, designed by Raphael Vignoli. I will encourage you to read the really distinguished uh, bio of, of Bill as well, and we're thrilled to have him here. I had the pleasure of, I've had the pleasure several times of meeting with him and, and being at, at the illustrious Cleveland Museum of Art uh, since I returned. And if you'll give me a, just a moment of personal privilege, I often tell the story as a kid growing up in Glenville uh, and in Huff, stories of, of my mom sending me and my brother off to get out of her hair on a weekend. And my brother Johnny and I would walk up to uh, the Museum of Art. And you know, it's still free after all these years. And I remember getting lost in, in just the wonders of that hall of, of those wonderful knights in shining armor. And it's still there. Uh, so I, I sort of have a personal connection to that experience that stays with me to this day. Let's move on to Catherine Heidemann. Catherine Heidemann became the Cleveland Institute of Arts 11th president on July 1st, 2022. That is just a few weeks ago. So congratulations to Catherine. A senior arts management and higher education leader, she first joined CIA in 2019 as Vice President of Academic Affairs and Dean of Faculty. In her role as the college's Chief Academic Officer, she was responsible for programming, curricular development, and delivery, academic operations and strategy, student affairs, and accreditation and assessment. She played a key role in the development of CIA's most recent strategic plan. She led the, co led the college's successful reaccreditation process. And there's so much more. She hails from Pittsburgh, Carnegie Mellon. Um, again, uh, new arrivals and, and those who are already here, she brings a wealth of knowledge about how various cities are incorporating arts and culture into their development 
and it's been a privilege for me to really be see Catherine as another black partner. Thank you for that. Um, and I learned recently that not only is she a visual arts champion, she's also a musician and is an active member of a band or of a new band to come. So talk to her about that. So I'll, 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 artist for all seasons. Next up, Megan Likens Reich. In January 22, Megan and following a national search, the board of directors for the Museum of Contemporary Art Cleveland, MOCA as we know it, named Megan its new executive director. She joined MOCA in 2004 and has served as MOCA's interim executive director since June 2020. During her MOCA tenure, Reich has organized or coordinated 34 exhibitions with more than 200 artists, written and edited 13 catalogs and books, produced hundreds of public programs, connected MOCA to hundreds of audience members, managed expenses, supervised innumerable, innumerable cross-departmental and inter-organizational initiatives, and helped raise millions of dollars for the organization. She was a key senior supervisor for MOCA's new building project. She's been responsible for collaborative programming with many of Cleveland's leading institutions. She served as co-author of MOCA's most recent strategic plan and led numerous initiatives to elevate engagement and inclusion across the museum's programming and physical environment. We, there's much more in, in Megan's bio. I encourage you to, to look at it as well. With that, I think I've covered all of the folks in front of you. Um, I just want to acknowledge we have today uh, serving as our, our ASL American Sign Language interpreter, Kelly. <laughs> Kelly and Jason. All right, for, for those who follow American Sign Language, Thank you for your service. And on behalf of, of those who follow those services. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Deirdre for my directions. I turn it over to Jennifer. Jennifer, take it away. Thank you so much. So thank you everyone for being here on a Saturday morning. I have to warn you, this is my lowest intellectual capacity time, <laughs> Saturday from 9 to 12. But uh, it's great to be here. I've been looking forward to this panel, it's actually this weekend, um, since we first started talking about it at the beginning of the year, I think, so wonderful. So this is not going to be, I think we, we intuitively started to, to curve out our chairs here because this is really going to be a conversation. It's not sort of ask questions and you know different people apply. So feel free everyone to jump in. Um, some of the questions, we have a wonderfully diverse group here of uh, museum directors, um, front developers and visionaries, and school. We have our Arts Institute represented. We have folks who have been, um, got their directorships this year, actually, although they've been very familiar with their respective organizations. And then we have the elders. <laughs> Just being, yeah. Our, our <laughs> Eminence Grease. <laughs> Uh, uh, folks, so we have a great perspective here in regards to talking about arts leadership, visual arts, and if you will, contemporary arts leadership in Cleveland. So I'll just start really, this is a question for everyone, which is the past two years have been unprecedented, a word that is really overused but uh, still very descriptive. There's been so many changes, upheavals in the arts world with COVID and many other things. And I would like to find out how everyone is. As the uh, young folks say, <laughs> this is a vibe check. <laughs> so we'll start with John since you're... Okay. Um, 
I like that. I like the vibe check. Um, start using that. Um, so down at the Akron Art Museum, we are actually we're doing extremely well. Um, I know Jennifer was referring to the pandemic, but the museum itself back in 20 had some significant opportunities. And I really like to uh, frame it up as, as the perfect storm that um, did indeed do just that, prevent, actually presented to us opportunities. And so we had uh, some leadership opportunities, of which I arrived in May of 20. We had, um, of course, um, the much needed, what I call much needed, racial justice of George Floyd in June of 20. Of course, March of 20 was when COVID really hit and shut down. Uh, then we go into a summer of um, protests at our museum, specifically a few protests, but also uh, what I call the great polarization, political polarization during the presidential campaign. And then we will ride in, right into fall and, um, and, and so on and so forth in the next wave of, of, of the pandemic. So, but all of those really uh, provided us with some significant opportunities as an organization to give us some time to sit back and rebuild, uh, really focus on who we are, what our mission is. We developed a tran uh, transformation plan. And the result of which, not to get into all the details, but the result of which is we've got an organization right now that is stronger and better than ever, um, really looking um, what I call being people driven first. Uh, no disrespect to the collection, but really focusing on the team there at the museum and the organizational culture, but also on the relationships in the community and how important they are. And I think many organizations also probably had to take a step back, um, even those that didn't have some of the personal challenges that we had to really say, hey, relationships really matter. And so we've really positioned ourselves to collaborate in a lot of ways that perhaps in the past we would never even entertain a conversation. And I think we need to remain um, open in that regard. So overall, we are doing extremely well. Shall I just jump in? So, um, uh, so at the Cleveland Museum of Art, obviously the, uh, the past two and a half years have been just, you know, Really, they've been really challenging, uh, but uh, but we're we are recovering, and I would say that we are in recovery. Um, uh, attendance has begun to recover to pre-pandemic levels. Um, revenues are still a little bit depressed, but we're getting there. And um, and I, I'm really optimistic about the future. Uh, Solstice returned in June. Um, Provenance, our restaurant, finally reopened after two and a half years, just two weeks ago. Um, we've got Mix coming back um, on the 7th of October, so a really popular program, which thenceforth will take place on the first Friday of every month, and Parade the Circle next summer, and great programs this fall. So I'm, I'm actually really optimistic, and, and as John was saying, I think there, there were many, many silver linings to the pandemic, and we're going to benefit from those going forward. Um, there are lots of them that give us time to reflect. Uh, we emerged from this period with a, a new strategic plan. Uh, we emerged from it with um, uh, you know, a, a renewed commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, the topics that we'll be touching on today. And I think really importantly, we emerged from this um, the members of this group, I think, if anything, closer than ever before, because we actually spent um, uh, the Wednesday afternoon every week talking together uh, with the, 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 among the leaders of the local arts and cultural organizations. So I think there's much uh, to, to look forward to. Final thing I'll say is that the great leadership challenge that I'm having right now is just encouraging people to be hopeful, to be optimistic. I think it's been such a tough period for the staff um, that bringing people around and inspiring people to um, uh, recognize that the future is bright um, is, is, uh, is something that we need to keep an eye on. So that's how we are. Okay, I'll start with a personal vibe check. I'm so excited to be in this room with all of you and to see so many familiar faces, people who I worked with now, who I've worked with in the past and in the longer past that I haven't had a chance to hug until today. So. I'm really gratified by the fact that now we are actually able to be together because I think one of the biggest challenges in the past two years has been the lack of ability to come together, to feel each other's energy, and to really you know, work in, in person in collaboration. So I'm really gratified by this moment. 
uh, and representing Mocha and, and my colleagues, we had a staff appreciation party last night and it was just an opportunity of absolute gratitude. We are feeling excited. We are a leaner team than we were at the beginning of the pandemic. We're about a third smaller. Um, so there is also a reality of some exist, you know, ongoing issues of exhaustion and uncertainty. But we, as a group, are, I think, far closer. We are creating a space of care and support for each other, and we have some amazing opportunities that we are leaning into right now. We have some wonderful new board leadership, and we're doing some amazing board activity this fall around a strategic visioning process that I think will be an opportunity to even further realign and get uh, not only clear, but really excited for what lies ahead for MOCA. And so I'm feeling optimistic, like my colleagues, and I agree that the need to continue to um, lean into hope and opportunity is going to be really important as we continue to recover, because we are nowhere done from recovering yet. Hi, good morning. Um, so I think I have an opportunity, although I'm not new to my organization, in my new role, um, to really, I'm trying to think very, very intentionally about where we've been and where we are. And I'm, I'm really encouraging everybody to take a very, very, very deep breath in and a very even, uh, a very big exhale. I think it's important as an institution of higher learning as much as uh, I don't, we don't love when bad things happen, I embrace those things as teachable moments and learnable moments. And for me, just seeing, I am absolute, to say how inspired I am to see just the innovation of our faculty, how they came through this time. You know, even just, I remember the moment back in March 2020, oh, let's figure out in five days how to flip our entire very high touch art design classroom online. Sarah Paul, you're there. I appreciate you, one of our faculty. Our students, um, ET, I see you back there. I know you worked your butt off and you came through. And just, I am utterly inspired to see what came out of that and especially the, the process of creativity and just how fierce it really is. I mean, it's, no, it's not a surprise that the art institutions are the ones that really came through and persevered the most through this, the hardest time. So. And in thinking about the moments now, I've been on a very robust listening tour for the past few months um, with, with various stakeholders, faculty, staff, and students. And I've heard um, a lot about their, their sense of pride, but also learning just so much about the grit and the resilience that has come out of this process. Um, but even the new students, or new students who just started, we asked what they were most excited about coming, coming to CIA. I didn't hear art, I didn't hear the de de uh, design. I actually heard three things. It was actually a big word cloud and it was very, very uh, bold and apparent. And those three things were friendship, community, and independence. And that's something that I am really trying to harness, um, especially I think it's really important before, yes, I have big bold ideas and uh, share those with my team, but this is a really great opportunity to reconnect to ourselves and really focus on uh, empathetic culture and, and, and uh, courageous, um, being bold, being, um, but also being vulnerable together. And um, I just really want to harness that, uh, starting off sort of clean slate, I just got a moment here, and this is, to me, this is just a really good, great opportunity for us to, we're reconnecting to our values and to our mission and really kind of starting over to get together with a reset. So that's been, I think, a very strong positive to bring to bring our community together. Um, great, well, um, uh, I have to say it has been an incredibly difficult couple of years. It essentially, uh, the pandemic blew up our plan completely and uh, delay our program for an entire year. That was a, uh, 2020 was a very bleak time when it felt, um, uh, literally this initiative was very much at risk. It uh, might not have happened. Uh, but um, and in part because of the people who were sitting here, it did happen. And it's an incredible validation, I think, of, uh, of our concept that, um, 
we had um, this incredible partnership, this collaboration. Um, and if anything, silver linings, we've all mentioned it. Um, coming out of the pandemic, I think the importance of FRONT and our collaboration and arts and culture across the community is more important than ever. I think um, uh, you know, um, being a part of the recovery um, and looking towards a future that I think we all agree is actually very bright has been is um, uh, uh, it's just very gratifying and very validating. I thank everyone for their participation in front, which feels like a little bit of a new dawn for all of us. So thank you. Um, I'm very struck by the conversation about community and empathy and the idea of us all being here together, which I think, you know, we almost take for granted a little bit, but we haven't been here. We haven't been at um, things like this, except in little boxes. So I, I really appreciated that, and um, uh, it's a great thing. I just want to kind of hold a moment there for some of those um, ideas. We didn't lead, actually, with art. We led with people, and uh, that's an important statement to actually um, sit with a little bit. But I do want to talk a little bit about the fact that, especially for museum directors, um, there was an article last year, so it's probably a little bit out of, um, uh, the numbers might not be right, but with museum directors, last year about this time, last fall, there were 22 vacancies in some of the larger organizations. And, um, you know, that, that I think, you know, obviously there's always, um, Attrition, but it seemed like that was very high. And again, we talked about the difficulties of the last couple of years. But um, for the directors, sort of, what are your thoughts on the fact that uh, people are taking a pause before they actually, and you know, two of you have, you know, sort of taken the plunge, and one of you has stayed very constant during that time. So uh, what do you think that's happening nationally? These are you know, 22 of the larger institutions in the nation, but still. As the, as the elder. <laughs> I'm, I'm the elder, I'm the Eminem Screes. Um, uh, so, um, I mean, just a couple of very quick reflections, um, but again, I'm optimistic that will be the bottom line. I mean, first of all, one has to understand that these, these jobs, the position that I inhabit, uh, it, 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 it has changed dramatically over the past several decades. So um, even though Sherman Lee also was the director of the Cleveland Museum of Art, I would say that our, our jobs are completely, completely different and the jobs have evolved, uh, these jobs have evolved pretty dramatically even during the period uh, since I became a, a museum director um, less than 20 years ago. And, um, uh, and in, in many ways, it can seem a thankless task, and I'm aware that that is one of the reasons that uh, there are many young people who are hesitating to enter these jobs, which now have less, arguably, to do with art than they do with uh, fundraising and, and, um, and management and, and leadership. Uh, but I, for one, am really optimistic um, and I think that there, are, there is an extraordinary new generation coming up. And, um, and I, I hardly need to say more than that because they're right here, here today. And you'll hear from them. And there are wonderful new ideas and our field will continue to change and change for the better. And it's thanks to those people. Um, so um, uh, I, think, um, I think it's going to be fine. I'm not worried about American museums. I'll just add, I, I love hearing the optimism there, Bill, and I, I, I couldn't agree more, especially being new into this role. Um, you know, there's a difference of sitting on the board for 10 years and now running the organization. So uh, my eyes have been greatly open, and, and um, I do believe, though, you know, I think it's a combination of, in regards to what's currently happening from what I've read and other uh, directors that I've spoken to. And I think, you know, what's needed or should be is, is, a, is an alignment between the institution's values and, and the board and the leadership. And um, so it's sort of like that perfect recipe or, or what have you. So we have to really make sure they have that right. And so 
an organization has a vacancy or what have you is because they're still hopefully tweaking that, tweaking that recipe and waiting for the right individual or what have you. Um, but I also think, because we keep going back to this, is, is uh, you know, Bill just mentioned leadership, and I think that's extremely important. And even though uh, you know, I've, I've sat on many boards of different organizations and things of that sort, but in the not-for-profit, I, I tend to continue to witness the lack of leadership in, in developing individuals and things of that sort. So I look at this room, I look at, I look at um, my fellow panelists here, and really think, you know, we need to continue, as leaders, we need to continue to, to develop others. Uh, those of you that are leaders in the audience, um, challenge you for that same responsibility, and really put that emphasis and be willing to cross over roles and things of that sort and, and disregard some of the, the um, stereotypes that have existed around, around specific roles and, and, ter and territories and things of that sort. Because that's really where it is, and I do agree with Bill. I think there's, there's gonna be this very, uh, wonderful surge of up and coming uh, leaders that are going to be able to carry our institutions forward in a very positive way. Um, representing an organization that's built on the notion of change um, and a museum that is sort of a is a bridge between the esteemed collections and the schools that train the artists as an organization that's sort of changes in our DNA. I, I do think the uncertainty that the past two years brought um, made it difficult, uh, and the I should say, and the necessary structural changes that have been demanded by staff, museum staff, museum boards, the community, in some cases, demanded a change of leadership, and uh, the most self-aware leaders either decided that they were able to accommodate and help move that change, or that they, that they could apply their skills in other ways and allow space for someone who could bring in the new vision or um, help the board and staff create that pathway to that structural shift that needs to happen and is continuing to happen. So I don't think, you know, I, I, I would say nonprofit leadership. I mean, who's a nonprofit leader in the audience? There's a lot. None of you, I assume, not speaking on behalf of you, would say that it's been an easy two years. We're not, it's not unique to museum directors at all. And in fact, some of the, um, some of the support systems that are in place in long, you know, long standing institutions allowed for less stress than was experienced by more emerging nonprofits in the cultural sector who were still trying to find their footing. And then the pandemic laid an entire new um, layer of challenge. So um, I think, to John's point, there is a need to continue cultivate le cultivating leadership um, and thinking of ways in which the kind of siloed behaviors that directors of large organizations maybe behaved in the past is, is interrupted and changed so that actually the leadership becomes more of a shared experience across the institution and across other institutions as well into that it's definitely disrupted education as well. Um, co the college and higher education world has also seen a similar surge in uh, resignations, retirements, and especially in the faculty side as well. It's never, I will say this over and over, I don't think it's ever been harder to be an educator as it is now. Um, there's so much between, you know, teaching, it, there's so much to reward, but it's incredibly challenging um, for, with respect to, to challenging um, in our case, we, uh, you know, we have generational differences in our classroom, sometimes as many as three generations in the classroom. We have neurodivergent neuro learners. We have um, accommodations. We have a lot of accountability, and it's really, really hard. And it's, so I think it's really important to cultivate and take care of our educators as well. There's a huge K-12 teacher shortage right now as well. So these are the kinds of things that we need to develop pipelines and make sure that we're taking care of our teams as well which is uh, why I also started a teaching center, a resource center to support, support the faculty and uh, hopefully in, help them develop into positions of leadership as well. I'll just add one quick thing. Um, I uh, strongly believe there is no cooler job than um, being the director of a museum or arts and culture institution. Um, uh, yeah, I think those who um, uh, are uncomfortable with change are kind of getting shaken out of the system a little bit, and that's not such a terrible thing. Um, but um, uh, 
uh, people who are uh, embrace change and who are change makers, this is still an incredible job. Uh, and, and I think it will continue, institutions will continue to attract amazing talent. That's great. We're going to stay on uh, issues of change because with the murder of George Floyd in 2020, we saw a very, very harsh light being put specifically on visual arts and culture and the fact that leadership still remains predominantly white. I mean, I'll, I'll state the obvious that everyone present company accepted here um, is white. And the leadership, and I mean the arts leadership, is has not made significant changes. We've seen some organizations nationally make those changes, have more um, curators of color or maybe art directors of color. Um, but in some cases, we have to wonder if that is in fact a trend that is uh, not gonna stay or if it is something that is really going to profoundly affect what's happening in arts and culture. So, you know, again, we don't see leadership here, I think, in any of the institutions of the senior leadership of color. Uh, there have been some changes. I'm not going to say that, that, you know, nothing has happened. But we really, I think that given that we are in a city that is, in Cleveland, predominantly majority black and brown, um, Akron is maybe not quite, but still there's a significant community of color. So how are your organizations internally so this is a big question for everybody, I think. Internally looking at their staff and what changes can, can happen and to start to reflect what our community looks like, but also that engagement with the community and how to be relevant for everyone. So. Yes, great, thank you. Um, this is an important question and an area of implicit focus for MOCA. Um, who absolutely had um, events shared and, and occurred in 2020 that encouraged our organization to look hard at the areas that we were falling short, especially with respect to racial equity. And so representation has been a key focus of the organization um, since that time, even in some cases before that time, and we have made changes that we will continue to lean into in regards to just representation our board representation was woefully under um, at that time, and we have grown by over 220% our BIPOC representation on our board, which is now almost 30%. We also introduced a new board leadership model that welcomed our first black female co-president to our board, who's with us today, Audra T. Jones, who I can't, I can't see where you are, there you are. Um, and then at the staff level, uh, we've intentionally updated, and at the governance level, our recruitment strategies to encourage um, candidates of color and candidates that represent diversity along other demographics to engage in our, in our opportunities, which at MOCA, you know, we're a small staff. We have uh, 15, 18 full-time staff and 15 part-time staff, so it's still a small organization. Um, but we have managed to increase our management team BIPOC representation by 40%, uh, is now 40% of our management team. It was zero at the beginning of the pandemic. So these changes matter, but I want to stress that those are part of the story. The more important thing around relevancy is that the organization is constantly evolving when any new voice is brought into the leadership or into the conversation. So. Uh, always being responsive and integrating the conversation around how the museum wants to adapt to become more relevant is really about voice sharing voices, opening it up, introducing uh, advisors, and speaking more with the community, increasing our partnerships, and for us, elongating our partnerships. So looking at opportunities to spend longer time working in community with partners like Museum of Creative Human Art, like Julio de Burgos Cultural Arts Center, like Third Space Action Lab, who we continue to work with in long form patterns so that we can lean on each other, learn from each other, and grow our goals alongside the mission and goals of organizations that are entrenched uh, in our community as well. So those are the things, some of the things that we're doing. Uh, well, this is such a, it's such a huge question, and um, and so I'm gonna um, uh, 
say a few words about, uh, about staffing and a few words about, um, about relevance also. Um, so in, and, and obviously there's, I think there's no more important conversation taking place in our field right now. Um, and, um, and, and I think, I think what we're seeing is a trend actually, and it's a really positive trend. So, um, uh, in 2018, the Kluge Museum of Art, uh, adopted the first comprehensive diversity, equity, and inclusion plan of any major U.S. museum. And, and we've tried at any rate, not only fully to implement that plan, but also to uh, really lean into it following the murder of George Floyd um, and other events of the past uh, of the past several years. And, and um, I, I want to really thank uh, some of our trustees for that support because Helen Forbes Fields, who's here, was very involved in the creation of that plan and Fred as well. So um, uh, that plan set out to diversify, and I think this is important for all museums, especially big historic institutions like the Museum of Art. Um, our, uh, our collection, our exhibitions, our program, our uh, staff, our vendors, our audiences, um, and our entire field. Um, and with respect to, to the staffing piece and leadership piece, I would say that our senior staff is somewhat more diverse today than it, than it, than it used to be, but other parts of our staff are much more diverse. And we, we've achieved this in a very deliberate way. I mean, we, um, we, we insisted for the first time that there be a truly diverse uh, pool of candidates for every position, regardless of the position. Uh, we trained our managers in, um, in interview techniques that, that, uh, that uh, avoided uh, the pitfalls of unconscious bias. We, we really focused on this, and so at, at our place, it's true, um, the executive leadership team remains almost uh, entirely white, and that will change over time. But um, in the realm of, uh, say, uh, our curators, um, which is a key position since so many directors, including me, began as curators, um, when uh, in 2015, um, we had, I think, 16% of our curators identified as black or indigenous or people of color, and most of those were Asian American. Um, and at that time, a Mellon Foundation survey established that 12% of American uh, uh, major US museum curators uh, identify as BIPOC. Um, that number had risen in 2018 to 16%. Today, at the Cleveland Museum of Art, 35% of our curators identify as black or indigenous or people of color. Um, in the, the, the national average for conservators, uh, which is a very undiverse field, um, in 2018 was 11%, and now fully a third of our conservators uh, uh, identify as black or indigenous or people of color. And among our educators, which is really important because they're the people who interface with our public, um, we've gone nationally uh, from 20% uh, to 26% in 2018, that's the most recent year for which there are numbers. Uh, for, for us today, it's 44% it's of our educators, up from just 18% uh, in 2015. So these are real changes, um, not enough. We have a lot more work to do if they're real changes. The other critical piece is not just um, hiring people, but also um, uh, creating opportunities for, for young people who might someday be interested in museum careers, but are you know, potentially unfamiliar with the fact that that is a career path. And I think that institutions like ours can make a difference in that respect. So we've got a program, a program called Currently Under Curation, which uh, allows teens from underrepresented backgrounds to curate exhibitions um, at uh, Cleveland Public Library branches. Um, we're eager to start doing that actually at our main campus as well. Um, and they've also been involved in curating a project at Transformer Station. Uh, we've, we've got similar programs for college students. We've got uh, um, uh, director's fellowships for students from HBCUs. We're going to start doing this with tribal colleges and universities as well. Um, and we've created micro-internships to encourage uh, students from underrepresented backgrounds to gain the experience that they need in fields like conservation where the, the barriers to entry are high. Um, I, I, I want to pass the mic, but I'll just say, you know, re the relevance issue is one that really is important to me. Um, we are really uh, committed to increasing the representation uh, of, 
um, of artists from underrepresented backgrounds in our collection. Um, you see it in our collection, in our exhibitions, uh, or at least I hope you've seen it in our exhibitions just this past year, Currents and Cross Currents uh, on um, Contemporary Black Art, um, uh, The New Black Vanguard, a wonderful exhibition that just closed, um, Picturing Motherhood Now, which takes a very broad view of diversity, and in our collection, things are really changing. If you look at our abstract expressionist galleries, where we used to have, you know, there was a time when it was you know, Rothko and de Kooning, and, uh, and, and we added Lee Grasser, and then a few years ago, we added Norman Lewis, and um, as you'll hear soon from Steve Litt, um, we're about to add another painting to that gallery. We'll announce that just next week uh, by another really important black artist uh, in, who um, was a real, uh, leader of the, of the abstract expressionist movement. So there is so much that we have to do, and I think it's one of the most exciting things in our field right now is that expansion of the canon and, exp and exploration of new themes. No, for me. That's a lot, Bill, I, I, I admire that, and we're going to have to talk a little bit more about it because there's a lot of applicable initiatives that we can even apply at the Akron Art Museum, which of course is much smaller. We are a staff of um, 50 individuals, of which about 30 are full time. So on the staffing side of it, um, it does remain a, a challenge. We have uh, certainly increased our, our initiatives and, and intent and strategy regarding seeking applicants of color. Um, we are, it ebbs and flows with us, depending on um, individual changes, uh, things of that sort, but we are much more, um, you know, attempting to seek out uh, different and new ways and uh, look at how can we attract um, individuals to, to come join us at the museum. It is a little more challenging when the position is specialized. So for instance, we have a chief curator position open right now. And it's also a little bit more challenging in general um, when, I, when I think about, you know, we're a mid-sized museum in Akron, Ohio. A lot of up-and-coming curators want to be on the East or West Coast, things of that sort. I know Fred and I have had a discussion about this as well, and really looking at how can we really attract and, and um, someone to Akron, right? And then hopefully have them stay for quite a while, and that's that's the goal. So um, I have found, in addition, uh, that it's been extremely important to to really, I want to call it, you know, you know, get on the get on the ground floor of recruitment versus just the traditional, well, we put the posting out there, that type of thing. So we're looking at, at different ways to, to spread the word. Um, along the same lines, though, um, you know, part of our transformation plan was our DEAI committee, which became an official committee of the board uh, in late of, uh, fall of 21. And that continues to, to um, really strengthen us. Uh, it's, it's doing its job. The best example I have recently is we just expanded our, our parental leave policy. So we have the classic parental leave policy, which was guided by the medical policy, and now it's a very much broad parental leave policy for um, any any form of, of um, uh, bringing a child into a family. And so that has been very well received, but it, it actually stemmed from a discussion with members of the DEI committee, and then we brought that forward and, and had, that, um, had that changed. Um, in addition, uh, like the Clean Museum of Art, we've, we have uh, really taken a look at the collection and the demographics of that collection. And so we have a curatorial vision that was uh, launched about a year ago that is guided, one of the main principles is to uh, you know, bring, bring uh, new works into the collection of artists who are underrepresented, uh, rep underrepresented excuse me. And so even our last three acquisitions are all of artists of color. So we really have an initiative. And then once those three came in, we put them immediately on view. Um, and then we've also changed our collection galleries. And so they're, they are now themed, and um, which to me is, helps to increase accessibility because you walk into a given gallery and you understand the theme and you're already making a connection with the artwork in that gallery. It's not uncommon. I know other museums do that, but Akron had not changed their collection galleries in well over 10 years to a significant extent. So that has been a wonderful um, uh, step forward uh, as well. And then we have also, uh, we're launching next week our Community Advisory Council. And so that is for, that's represented by uh, individuals from uh, the numerous neighborhoods in Akron. And they're working on a specific project at the museum 
which is tied to an upcoming exhibition that we're going to be having that has um, wonderful programming elements as well. But we're paying those members of the community to come in uh, and serve on that on that council. And so I'm really looking forward to the to the work that they're going to uh, accomplish. Um, help them be successful. So that's something that's where I'm really interested in doubling down on student success. And one of the things that we, um, in understanding too, that we have we there's been over the years uh, some of our our BIPOC students have not had a great experience, and um, I find that as an opportunity. So um, just this year uh, in August we launched a, a new program um, called the Noon Scholars Program, which is. Uh, named after the most recent president, Grafton Nunes, and it is really essentially a pre-orientation program um, uh, for students, for first-generation students, um, as well as uh, students who identify as BIPOC, to get them a little bit more extra resources and, and, uh, and support that they might need to navigate in college experience, which is something that a lot of our students have asked for throughout the years. This came out of, um, this was an, an initiative that came out of our um, semi-newly formed IDEA Council, which stands for Inclusion, Diversity, and Equity Awareness, um, as something that, made, that was a really priority to move forward. So we just launched this, and we're in the process of assessing that and tracking the success of those students who are participating in the program. It also includes one-on-one -on -one mentorship with other student leaders, um, and I'm really excited to see where um, uh, the impact that will make. Um, another idea, uh, priority of the IDEA Council, especially this year, given the sort of increase that we're seeing in some of the faculty resignations and retirements, um, is we really need to do uh, a lot of the, the diversity of our faculty. Uh, we are doing really well on the staff side. In the last two and a half years, one out of, out of three of our, our new hires have identified as um, as BIPOC, but on the faculty side, this is um, an area that we are really trying to understand systematically and create structures by which for, for recruiting and retaining um, uh, faculty. Um, we still have a lot of work to do on the board side as well, um, and to me it's it's also a lot drilling into the, the policies and procedures as, as you mentioned earlier, um, you know, even just being intentional about, about you know, what vendors we're working with, and well, it might be easiest to just call Panera next door to, to get catering, you know, making sure that we are representing the community that we're serving. So um, the curriculum is an area that I spent a lot of time in the last two years in my last role, um, especially in art history. I know I have a lot of art historians here. We spent a lot of time literally turning our art history curriculum inside out and decolonizing it. Not changing history, but changing, changing the way we teach it. And a lot of work, especially want to uh, credit uh, Dr. David Hart, who really led a lot of this effort and um, made some phenomenal um, progress in decolonizing our uh, various parts of our curriculum. Uh, another area that we looked at was the critique, critique process, which inherently has some challenges um, in, in sort of the power dynamics of that and how, you know, understanding that's a really big part of art school, but um, keeping in mind that there are, there are different ways of thinking about it um, moving forward and from a DEI lens, and we're, we're really looking forward to delving into that even more um, through the, the launch of our, our uh, J.B. Nord Center for Teaching and Learning. That's, that's a focus area of that as well. Um, in our, we do have an exhibition portfolio as well through our various galleries, most notably our Rheinberger Gallery, which hopefully you can check out the wonderful front exhibit before it closes. But uh, our curators there and our team has done a really fantastic job in ensuring that there is representation in what's on the walls and um, as well as in uh, integration of our study collection as well. Um, and I think uh, that's there we've made some really tremendous improvement. Um, but I think this is one of the this is one of the things that I there's so much work to be done and as a school I uh, am embracing learning and I'm always I love to hear from the students about what they think we should be doing um, much more to do and I'm excited for what's next uh, great well <clears throat> front is a bit unique in that we're really uh, kind of a virtual organization with an extremely tiny staff um, and yet we have many many partners um, of course, the uh, institutional partners, but um, uh, dozens of vendors, um, hundred artists. We're extremely intentional about who we work with um, um, and the issues that we ask artists um, and our partners to address. Um, uh, 
Uh, and, um, and certainly, the past two years has greatly influenced that work. Um, uh, I think over 50% of the artists participating in front are BIPOC. Um, over 50% are, are women um, or uh, identified as non-binary. Um, and um, the subject of O Gods of Dust and Rainbows, derived from a poem by Langston Hughes, is, um, very much addresses issues of equity uh, head on. Um, but there's a lot of work to do. Um, and, uh, uh, and one of the things that uh, the last two years has really uh, caused us to consider is what can we do to invest in a lasting way, in a sustainable way, to provide more opportunity um, uh, uh, for uh, communities that have not had those opportunities. Um, there, um, uh, so the Art Futures Fellowship, which we launched this uh, this year, which is a significant investment in building careers of BIPOC artists in Cleveland, is a big part of addressing the problem that we all face, is um, we need a bigger pool of, um, of talent, of color, uh, that's had the opportunity to rise in the art world. So I'm optimistic that we're making progress, but there's lots more to do. These are all really, really good, I think, structural things that are happening. But um, just to talk a little bit about, um, or sort of echo our mayor, who in his campaign said, Cleveland can't wait. And the issue is that there's been such tremendous disinvestment in Cleveland for our black and brown people. And um, we see that, especially with our artists in, in Cleveland. And there is sort of the intellectual knowledge that things are not what they should be. But then there's perspective of the artists and the organizations that have had pretty much nothing for decades. So there's a sense of urgency, I think, that goes along with the structural issues that are very complex to fix. But really, let's talk about what we can do to make those changes so that people, you know, absolutely feel comfortable coming to the, the well, the, you know, it's virtual, so keep you out of that. But, you know, in regards to arts institutions and coming through that front door sometimes is a challenge that a lot of us do not feel, but many of us do. So with having to take that sense of urgency within your organizations and know that things have to be changed for those children who are very young, that who have parents that are um, nervous that something is gonna happen when they come to the organizations. What can we do? Just sometimes you have to just do something that you know, is not necessarily a lot of thought, but make that difference. Um, just a case in point, when I got my position at Gund, Someone called up a black organization and says, I saw a picture in the paper. So I decided to call a black organization. It was just that simple. But that's why it's important to have that leadership that is highly visible, that I think is reflected in front and having a theme that is by a black poet. But really, are there things that are in the back of your head or maybe forward that just haven't kind of come up yet that you know just very simple, very impactful. I'll start over here, because you guys have been getting it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. I don't think I have a, I don't have a simple answer. You know, because it's many, it's literally, it's just many things. Um, uh, uh, you know, some of, um, you know, some of what we're doing is um, just trying to get out of the usual geographies. You know, how do we get um, arts and culture out of university circle? No diss against university circle, it's an incredible resource. But it's not where our, it's not where um, Clevelanders live. Um, and, um, you know, how do we make our institutions um, uh, welcoming? We actually, Transformer Station did a, uh, a walking tour with residents of um, uh, Lakeview Terrace 
which is uh, literally like two blocks away, um, and discovered that uh, those people didn't even know it was a museum, um, had no idea that it was free, had no, uh, and uh, no sense that they were welcome there. Uh, so one of the things we did was um, invest in new seating and shade for the front yard, just so that people could get close to us, uh, get a sense that um, it's actually a place you can go to that belongs to them. And it's, um, so you know, there's just many of these small gestures that become, um, uh, hopefully over time, uh, really impactful up very well for what I was thinking, right, because we just, uh, one of the things that has really been frustrating me since I arrived here three years ago, when I say to people, I, oh, I, I work at Cleveland Institute of Art, people are like, oh, that's great, I love the museum. No, no, yes. I said, me too, I don't work there. <laughs> Having to over and over, and I say weekly, clarify that we're our place of education, we're our place to learn, and that is something that we're and, and youth can participate as well. Um, I insisted, it finally happened, I'm really excited, I don't know if you all have been on um, ICIA lately, but we now have building signage that very clearly says, it says Cleveland is our college art design. We are a college, everybody. And we also have design, by the way, not just fine art. So those are the kinds of things, I think it's really important not to be mystifying who we are, you know? This is what we do, and we are a place of education, we are a place for everybody. And um, with that too, in your comment about University Circle, I absolutely agree. It is a bubble, and one of the and that's um, all the re one of the reasons that we are um, uh, uh, doubling down really in, in our sort of next wave of Cleveland and, and our CIA and what's next. It's really turning the institution inside out and going out in Cleveland. And one of the reasons that we are um, uh, have. Are, being, are part of this project that's coming up in a couple of years. I don't know if you all read Steve Litt's article from a couple months ago announcing the, the uh, forthcoming Midtown um, Collaboration Center building um, in, the, in E66 and Euclid. We will, we will be part of a, a large uh, partnership with Cleveland Foundation and many other partners, uh, UH, Case Western, uh, Jumpstart, and many, many others. Uh, it's very, very important that and, and it, that we are there, that we are part of that critical link um, to sort of link downtown to University Circle, and that we are, uh, this will be one of our most, uh, in my opinion, probably one of the most catalytic community engagement initiatives we have ever done, and that will really be uh, deep, delving deep into art design, but immersive technologies and AR and VR, and really pro providing a space for the community to participate in that process as well, and also connect to industry and other things. Um, community engagement is a very, very start, uh, strong priority for me um, and making sure that we're finding different access points um, and, and meeting the community where we are. Uh, this is the first year we are now part of, officially part of the Say Yes program, the Say Yes to Cleveland scholarship program in partnership with CMSD. We had not done that before. As of uh, this month, we are now officially a College Now site partner. We had never done that before. Uh, and again, some of these other initiatives to, to make, to, and of course we offer a lot of scholarships. Uh, the sticker price is a little shocking sometimes, so it's very, I'm on a, uh, the early phases of, very, of, a, of a comprehensive campaign to, um, to raise a lot of money, hopefully, for the endowment um, to support student scholarships. So there's a lot of work we need to do, but I'm so excited, especially in the next three years, um, to see where that takes us. Um, so your question began with the conversation of artists, so I'll start with that. It is a huge focus of our museum. And when the pandemic began, uh, and I assumed a role of an interim executive director, we began using three phrases to describe the core work that we were focusing on, which was supporting artists, serving community, and building equity. And the supporting artists was a really important question and we continue to circle it and understand how the museum can be better at supporting artists. And one way we do that is direct investment. And so we started thinking about how are we investing in the artists in our community? What opportunities are we giving to artists in our community? And how can we, how can we as a staff be more proximal to the artists in our community so we can learn from them? And so we immediately came up with some opportunities, including a residency on site at the museum, um, where artists uh, who were selected by a jury that included MOCA staff and community partners 
have a space inside the museum to come and work, uh, as well as access to our staff and our administrative offices so that we actually have artists like working with us as a staff and so we can learn from their creative uh, intellects and their and the way that they sort of think outside of the box and also provide whatever resources or area of, as areas of need exist, which in some cases is like supporting a grant proposal. It's not always about investing in the production of new work. Sometimes it's about helping build the, the muscles around being a professional living artist, which is incredibly difficult for anyone, but in Cleveland uh, is also even a little bit harder. We also do this through the lens of relationships with people, which is the most important way. Relevancy is built through trust. And so this is all about how we build trust with our communities. Um, and you mentioned youth. Uh, MOCA has a teen program called TEAM. It's an evolution of programs we've been hosting at the museum since we opened the building. But what I'm really excited about is our team manager, her name is Bobby Regans, began as a teen member of one of our previous cohorts. And she came up through our engagement guide program. We promoted her to a full-time assistant educator earlier this year. And she's leading and mentoring a group of teens every year who are interested in cultural you know, per careers and, and really working through the lens of how our staff become mentors for the next generation of youth in our immediate communities so that they not only see a path for artistic careers, but they see a path for potential museum careers. Um, and then the other thing we did, which I'm really excited about, was we became wage certified. Uh, Front also is a wage certified organization. It's a great organization in terms of building transparency and equity around how we compensate artists for any labor they do on behalf of the organization. Uh, one of the biases that is baked into our industry has to do not as, I mean, it has to do with race, but it also has to do with location. So artists who aren't living in coastal American cities or in major capitals in other countries sometimes are perceived as just not able to be as great as artists living in New York or, or Berlin, and that is patently untrue. And what has happened in the past is because of that and the structures that exist around artists who are living in some of those places is that the stipends that they would be paid for the same kind of work that they would be doing on behalf of the museum were very different. And so wage allows us to create a sense of equity across that. So when an artist has a solo exhibition of a certain scale and is commissioned to do new work, they are being paid a consistent fee regardless of whether they are an emerging artist who's 23 just out of, out of Cleveland Institute of Art or whether they're an artist who has three galleries representing them across the world. Because the labor is, in, is you know, assumed to be somewhat the same, but even more for the artist that's emerging, it's actually going to be even harder because they don't have that around them. So this is just one measure of ensuring that we can be transparent in how we're supporting artists through direct compensation and also to start to build a sense of equity across that work regardless of an artist's background. Um, again, to just try and build the resources into our community. So constantly looking at right now how to invest in artists here because it's a huge focus for the museum. I think there are a couple of pieces of this for, for us. I mean, one is, uh, and, I'll, and I'll start with this, um, kind of extending our welcome in university circle because as an institution, um, a very significant part of whose mission is to engage broad and diverse audiences with um, fragile original works of art that for various reasons, including climate control, cannot leave our building. University circle has to be a part of this. And then there's the other piece, which is the community itself, uh, going into the community. So I would say that you know we're trying to do everything we can to um, extend the welcome that we offer to all those who come to the museum. We've been free for a long time. Um, we're still having trouble getting the word out that we're free, um, uh, but uh, nevertheless, um, that's you know an, an important foundational um, uh, aspect of our work. We've recently built a new park to the west of the museum to open us up to the neighborhoods to the west of the museum, the, the, uh, the Smith Family Gateway, it's called. Um, we have implemented new trainings for all of our frontline staff, and we're extending that this year to everyone on staff to, to, to ensure that every single person who walks through our doors feels really welcome. Um, we're aware that, um, that our security guards um, may be perceived as, um, as a kind of a, you know, an in-house police force. And so we're about to adopt 
Um, as, and you'll see this as soon as supply chain disruptions allow us to um, implement it. Um, we're adopting a new, very um, kind of casual, unstuffy uh, uniforms for all our frontline staff. So, and, and this is just in addition to what I referred to a moment ago with respect to um, uh, extending the scope of our collection and really doubling down on on programs that we that, that are designed or, uh, with with uh, very diverse audiences in mind. Also, but going out into the community is important for us too, and we have, uh, as many of you know, an historic community arts program. And programs like Parade the Circle and the Chalk Festival um, have been an important part of that. Um, we also have a Studio Go van that takes art making activities into the community. Um, when that wasn't possible during the pandemic, we um, distributed thousands of art making kits to families and children. Um, and we've just opened, in, in the middle of the pandemic, and I'm very proud of this, a new, our first community arts center on, uh, on the west side of town in the Clark Fulton neighborhood, uh, very intentionally situated there in a, in a predominantly um, uh, Spanish-speaking neighborhood um, uh, that, that I, I, I hope and believe will uh, make the museum um, uh, more available to, uh, to, to people um, in a neighborhood that we didn't serve well at all in the past. So there's an enormous amount to do. We've got a lot of new leadership. We've got a new director of performing arts. We have a new director of the community arts program. Um, and, uh, and I'm uh, eager to ramp up this kind of activity in the, in the years to come. As I am, the, uh, the, the work that we do with local and regional artists, and, and we've just completed a new strategic plan that, um, that, that really foregrounds um, something we haven't done enough with, which is, which is local and community artists. So, um, so we have a, a lot of wonderful initiatives. As I, as I mentioned, we changed over the collection galleries, but specifically one of those themes of, of, of the gallery is images of blackness, which has been extremely well received. Along those same lines, uh, we are preparing uh, to launch later this fall uh, gallery guides. So instead of just entering the museum and you walk into the upstairs to the galleries and you're on your own and you're just seeing a security guard, um, we will have gallery guides. And actually, when I visited MoCA, um, they can give you some great information uh, regarding this program or what have you. And we're really excited about it because the focus is to increase the visitor's experience and meet the visitor where they are. And again, this is not a brand new idea, but I think it's extremely important for the African Art Museum to make sure that anyone who walks through the doors feels welcomed and they feel supported and they feel like they can engage and learn. And so uh, the training starts next week uh, with these folks. So it's combining our visitor services team along with uh, security there and really excited and they'll be in these wonderful colorful aprons uh, with hopefully um, some, some tools in those aprons to help engage visitors no matter uh, you know, where, who they are or what have you. So really excited about that. Um, along the same lines, um, the Akron Art Museum has continued to be very responsive to the community. Like most institutions, we were extremely responsive during the pandemic, um, offering free entry or what have you. Um, but throughout this summer, we were free uh, just in response to the community to provide the museum as a place to reflect, have dialogue, or just be. And this was all in light of, of the unfortunate uh, shooting death of Jalen Walker and really felt that um, we needed to offer the museum as, as a community resource as well. And that was extremely received by the community and very happy to, to be doing that. And I suspect that we will continue to respond in any type of situation like that in the future. Um, and then um, just in general, uh, I, I sort of go back to, um, you know, we are also using the wage program, but along those same lines is really being a good listener to other organizations. And we've made a concentrated effort to be involved in the community even more so. Um, the perception in the past was, oh, there's the Akron Art Museum, and then there's all these other institutions below the Akron Art Museum. And I don't believe that should be the case. We're an equal partner in the community, and that is one of the most beautiful things about Akron, is that the community really comes together to make positive change for, for its constituents. And so we're involved in a lot of different initiatives, uh, whether it's just providing some insight, or maybe we provide one little 
component of another organization's program, uh, or we're welcoming them into our, our um, space as well to just use our space, to sit in our lobby, have wonderful meetings, or what have you, or, or conversations. But just creating that sense of openness really helps to break down those barriers. Quick time check. How many of you have questions that you might want to ask? Okay, it's not everybody, but it's, we have, we're about 45 minutes out, so I just want to, I've got two more questions that I want to get through here with everybody, because they're really good questions. So um, we'll just try to be a little quick with this, and then get, because we want to give people time for for their questions. So uh, we had talked in, in our pre-meeting about the importance of, well first here, I'll back up, that's the second question, um, is to really talk about sort of the different, um, museums are, you know, for the community as we've all talked, but they have to be sustainable. Um, all of the all organizations, whether it's educational or with festival, but uh, there's a lot of different parties that you have to enter, that you have to answer to. Um, and there is really the business of art institutions. So that's a lot in addition to everything that the leaders have to do just to do their job every day. There's still the answer to looking at these different parties, whether it's the board, whether it's the press, whether it is uh, the community at large, whether it's government. So, you know, that's a, that's a very complicated dance that has to be done, um, and probably not everyone is satisfied every day. So, just talk a little bit about sort of that very delicate sort of dance that you did. Um, uh, great question, um, you know, front because it's um, so many things, um, has so many constituents. Uh, you know, we're, um, uh, yeah, we're an arts exhibition, but we're also an economic development uh, organization. Uh, so, um, uh, so, you know, those are like almost um, two diametrically opposite ideas in some people's minds. Um, but actually, in, you know, uh, I don't think that they're at all incompatible. Um, I think that you know, take the, um, the the sort of many different motivations and objectives of our supporters um, and find um, the place where they all overlap. Um, and that's sort of the secret of our support is um, uh, from uh, a corporation that uh, is really looking for marketing exposure to um, a um, an individual funder or a foundation that wants to support a art project that um, is, um, addresses a specific issue. Uh, there's really something for everyone in front, um, and so I, I've not found that to be a, um, an area where there's tension or conflict. I've actually found the fact that um, we have many, many different, um, you know, we satisfy many, many different objectives is actually an advantage to our organization. At CIA, we often, um, there, we often have to clarify to our various constituents that uh, tuition does not pay for everything. Again, like any nonprofit, there's always the, often the assumption that you know, tickets or the earned revenue, if you will, uh, covers all the costs, and that couldn't be farther from the truth with us. And I think it's there's an understanding, there, maybe there's a misunderstanding by um, many of our constituents that, that, that about that, and how important it is, you know, the fundraising element, how key that is um, into making sure that um, we are, uh, as much as we can, making the tuition accessible for our students, especially. And even one of the challenges and the tensions that we face, even now in our scholarship portfolio, we have a lot of restricted gifts from restricted donors. Um, you know, we have many, many, we have quite a few different majors. Our two largest majors, for example, are illustration and animation, but that is actually an area where we have the least amount of um, donor restricted scholarships. We have a lot of donors who want to give to painting in other areas. So how do we balance the, uh, you know, the advocacy of these uh, 
actually overrepresented uh, majors in terms of our enrollment, but underrepresentation with respect to uh, scholarships. So that's something that part of our and part of our um, campaign trail, if you will, but also in our advocacy to make sure that we um, are, are educating our constituents about the opportunities there. And like Fred said, we we have you know working with alumni, working with the community too, um, especially. Um, the, the tensions of understanding here that we, and our, our role as, a, as, a, as an institution of higher learning is absolutely essential that we are part of the community, that we are you know, really, really delving deep into Cleveland. I will say personally, um, I was just as, as much excited uh, coming to, to work, not just for CIA, but to come to Cleveland, because I think that there's huge opportunities as, uh, as a college of, of, of art and design to really do, redefine our role and our responsibility in the process of, of a city in transition, um, and not just about arts and design, but the process of design itself to solve civic and to solve wicked problems of the future. So I think, I, I'm i kind of lost right now. I don't even remember what the question is. But um, what was the question? Yeah. Yes, so I'm dancing. I was a dancer, so I, that's I'm a, we're, it's not well choreographed. I'm kind of in an improvisation right now, but uh, thank you. Yeah, so that, was, that was a great dance. <laughs> Truly a great performance. Uh, so uh, Fred, Fred made a wonderful statement. He said that there's something for everyone. And I think all of our organizations, I think we can figure out that in our organizations that there's something for everyone. So when we look at donors and, and all of that. Um, I really look at it as relationship nourishment. Uh, certainly the Akron Art Museum had its challenges in having to repair a lot of relationships, both with the community and individual donors, and so I've made myself available. Uh, communication has been key and really updating people, checking in with individuals. Um, transparency has been extremely important. There's not a single item or what have you that I would not share with a potential donor uh, or existing donor for that matter of whatever information they want uh, or if they seek to understand. There's also also opportunities though along those same lines uh, that I have found myself educating, um, especially during uh, these past few years of such drastic change. And so it's really again it sort of almost reminds me on the visitor experience side, you know, how do we meet um, individuals where they are, how do we meet these donors where they are, um, how can we explain to them what it is that we're doing, how do we even remind them, especially some of those long-term donors, that what we're doing at the Akron Art Museum has been what we've been doing for years. Uh, we just, we, we're, but, but now it may have more of a definition or a label to it or, or what have you, but we've been engaging with the community, we have been providing educational tours and so on and so forth. And, um, and then also just reminding um, you know, being mindful of the fact that, especially, this is my opinion, that as a modern and contemporary art museum, we have to change as the culture changes. We need to respond, be responsive to that. That's part of our mission. It's, it's, it's very important to bring, to bring the artwork, but it's through that artwork that is, is modern and contemporary that is saying this is what's happening in society today. And so we will continue to evolve. And I think that's where the challenge will come with some folks. But again, it goes back to that relationship nourishment. Um, thanks. Um, so I think the same is true even for uh, a comprehensive art museum, that we, we, we must continue to evolve, and, and, and we do. Uh, but I don't think this tension, although I understand exactly what you're citing, is, is acute. I really, really don't. Um, uh, the, among those who support the Cleveland Museum of Art, there is a very wide spectrum of political opinion, but they're all doing it because they believe in the mission of the museum and they are committed and they believe in, in, in the, the importance of the arts uh, and, and they believe in the importance of the arts in our community. And, um, and so, you know, I, my experience um, has been uh, that, that you know, our supporters are, are nothing but uh, committed to, to the work that we're trying to do. Um, and I do think it, it's important um, for the leaders of these organizations to kind of have a strong mission focus or even kind of ethical and moral compass. But I find that, that, that um, 
uh, our our supporters are with us are with us all the way. I concur with everything that's been said. I think something that um, in our pre conversation. I've been having conversations with other museum directors about who, even those not in Cleveland, um, is about the fact that it is in fact a business, a mission-driven business, but a business nonetheless. And the business model, um, in some cases, has been built on what may be a shifting model. And so being responsive to the fact that we need to identify new funding streams or new younger donors to come up into the organization with the same passion or with new kinds of focus as the donors who are now moving on and in some cases moving, you know, have passed on. Um, one of our most, you know, important philanthropists, Toby Devon Lewis passed away earlier this year and Toby was a model for what it meant to invest in the experimentation of contemporary art. Um, how to excite young donors into what it is to invest in the arts and what you get from it. What I find really exciting is um, when we look at our kind of last 10 years budgetarily, we note that um, what has been consistently rising is our annual fund, which is really just a testament to the belief that Clevelanders in our community have to the organization's mission. I mean, the annual fund is just a request for support without any expectation for a transactional you know, kickback. And the fact that that keeps growing every year is an indication for us that actually there's a great belief in and a great history and, and, and uh, encouraging behavior of philanthropy in this city. That is also led, I have to say, by foundations like the Gun Foundation, who demonstrates the importance of investment in culture. Um, and for museums like ours, and I'm sure like some of my colleagues, General operating support is what we need most because for us, 75 or to 80%, if not higher, of our budget is basically paying for the undergirding of the program. And so general operating support allows us to support all of that structure so that we can turn as many of our resources directly into the production of new work, to the investment in artists, to the service of community and the building of equity. So, you know, continuing to encourage foundations to be open to that, I think is gonna be really important for the continued health of our organization. And having advocates like Assembly for the Arts and Cuyahoga Arts and Culture, who understand that recovery right now is critical and stimulus funds for the arts sector are critical to help us all get back and move beyond where we even were before. I am so grateful for the advocacy that people like Jeremy and board members like China Sherman are doing to advance that reality not just for our organizations, but for organizations uh, across the city. So it's a really holistic experience right now, and relationships are really what are going to drive it forward and continue to get us, you know, into increasing areas of success. Okie dokie. We are at 11.30, so we only had that one question. <laughs> um, so now we're going to open it up to the audience in terms of what questions. All right, we could, I think we're gonna do this in a way where maybe we'll ask you to come up here on either side so that we can give you a mic. but we were talking about siloed behaviors in Cleveland. And I've lived in um, Seattle and Minneapolis and New York, and Cleveland seems to be very siloed between the arts community and the corporate community in terms of giving of individual like public art. And specifically, I'm concerned kind of about the Sherwin-Williams headquarters doesn't have any public art that I can able to find out. Is, is there any way that the art, that the art community can connect with Sherwin Williams and say, hey, we'd like you to step up to the plate? Uh, <laughs> oh my God, I believe the rest. I have their number. Make it happen. You know, I think it's. Uh, um, uh, I think uh, there is an opportunity to um, involve the corporate world more in um, uh, the community's arts and culture ecosystem, for sure. Um, and uh, it's uh, 
our collective job to make that case. Um, and uh, and you know, I'm I'm optimistic that uh, we're beginning to get some traction with that story. I'll just add to that on the public front. I think it's uh, as a fairly newcomer to the city. I was excited to see that the city does implement a, a, a percent for art program, which. Believe me, not everybody, not other cities, all the cities have this. Um, I, I recently came from Pittsburgh where I did serve an, as an art commissioner there, and that was something that, you know, and doing a lot of research, it was very clear that that was uh, something that we, I know that's different from a, a private facility, but it is something I think that we should celebrate, um, that it is part of the uh, the ecosystem of our, our, our uh, uh, the, the, at least the civic e ecosystem for public projects on, on, um, on public grounds. I'll just add, maybe I can be a little controversial because I'm a nonprofit here. But um, I sometimes think that the success that we had with our CAC percent for art um, actually gave some of the corporations a little bit of an out. So that corporate funding, which I think used to be a little bit stronger, maybe 10, 15 years ago, um, sort of went away a little bit. So I would love to see some of our corporations, Sherman Williams one, but there are other Fortune 500, and I think some of our smaller corporations are stepping up, but I do think some of our larger ones probably need to come back to the table. Hot take, Steve. <laughs> and I think the Cleveland Arts and Culture is a huge reason why corporations want to keep or come to Cleveland, it's a talent retention um, uh, point that art and culture is what drives the, the creativity of the city and why you know talent from outside of Cleveland or talent from Cleveland would want to stay here and work for a company like Sherwin Williams. So I think the narrative about the relationship of how art and culture actually helps businesses get and retain talent is something that needs to be really constantly reminded in the corporate community because that investment back is actually going to come back to them in, you know, in how their staff is able to accomplish their goals. Um, ditto to everything. Um, uh, I would just say that even, even though, um, of course, our, uh, our, these organizations, corporations, and, and arts and culture are perhaps more siloed than we would like. Um, my, in my experience, Cleveland is not a particularly siloed city um, with respect to arts and culture. We have this amazing group of cultural organizations and people are really deeply committed to their future. Um, I came here from New York City and talk about siloed. I mean, that is a very, very siloed place. The arts organizations really don't talk. And here they do. And so, um, uh, you know, I, I, I think we have reason uh, to be um, uh, to, to be really optimistic again about uh, about what we can all do together, including corporations and arts and culture organizations. So I'm from Suffolk County, so uh, <laughs> but Akron has those same opportunities, certainly on a smaller scale, and we've been very grateful to have uh, uh, some corporate support at the Akron Art Museum. But certainly the opportunities exist for for more. Um, the city itself has an Akron Arts and Culture Plan, which is a huge step forward. Uh, I am one of the public arts commissioners. Uh, that's been sort of a rough start, but we're, we're getting there. And just really draw, trying to draw attention. But most importantly, you know, we have a similar organization um, to the Assembly for the Arts or what have you called Arts Now, and they've done a stellar job at really bringing attention to the fact that arts and culture does exist in, in Akron, which is also helping with uh, bringing that same attention to some of the corporations as well. So we're hoping to garner uh, some additional support uh, we don't have the luxury of having a tax coming our way. Uh, we've got some initiatives uh, well in, in, into the future trying to figure out that, that formula or what have you. At least the discussions are being had and um, we hope that will you know, we'll benefit. But I think your question is, is, is spot on and I think you know, corporations, whether it's Sharon Williams or whoever, uh, really need to, to, to you know, step up to, to the plate here a little bit and, and help the community. This is by way of comment and question, uh, but sort of feeding off of the other question. Insofar as the uh, discussion about the location in the bubble for University Circle, Cleveland has always been divided by the river, I mean, subject to bridge wars in the whole history of the area. But there's an institution that I haven't heard mentioned today 
the metro park system, which encircles the entire area and reaches down you know, to the admin area and can pull things together in, in just another way. So any comments about nature, metro park system? Fully agree. Um, yeah, definitely that's something that I think that, um, actually I'm just thinking, Frank, do you have some, some Metro Park? That's kind of the, the obvious, but I, you know, I think that that's an opportunity that um, can be built on right here. Well, I, I think you're absolutely right. And really one of the key um, sort of uh, missions of front is to, um, break down those geographic barriers. The fact that we have 30 sites spread across the region, east side, west side, south, um, uh, their front is there to reintroduce um, uh, people of Northeast Ohio to their own communities. Um, and I think with each addition, bring people to neighborhoods that they've never visited before. Um, uh, uh, because that uh, exhibition is not just in the legacy institutions, but it's out in the community. Um, so uh, I think that's a key part of our mission. Um, uh, and um, your point about connecting to the park system is, is, is absolutely right. Uh, it's an incredible resource and, uh, 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 you know, you're giving me food for thought for Front 2025. <laughs> uh, good morning. My name is Frances Kajo Waters, and I'm thrilled to be here. My husband and I moved to Cleveland last year, so it's been one year. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so I'm um, really excited to be here. I was really shocked to find out what an amazing arts and culture scene you have here. Um, and I actually am very involved in arts and culture. We lived in Dallas for 20 years. Um, and, and served on the boards of like, you know, Dallas Theater Center, Dallas Theater. I've been very involved in arts, and I'm from New York before that. I had no idea Cleveland was so rich in arts and culture. So my question for you is this. Um, I don't know, is that on purpose? Like, I, 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 I can't figure it out. So I, I've asked people about that. I can't figure out, some people say, well, we don't want to let people know because they don't want them coming over. But I'm thinking you've got sort of this national gem um, that a lot of cities don't have. And I'm also thinking in terms of the economic impacts, right, of arts and culture, right? So when you think about the idea of cultural tourism um, and how much money, I mean, there are cities that are just thriving that don't even have nearly the resources you have here in cultural tourism because people will travel for arts and culture, which is you know, a little hidden fact. And we talk about diversity. Um, as you know, people are shocked. Um, BIPOC people, we travel just to find arts and culture. It's, it's an amazing thing. Um, so, um, so, so, the, so the question is simply um, this. Um, have you, what are you doing to sort of make sure that the rest of the world knows about the Cleveland arts and culture community? And um, is there a discussion about how you can increase cultural tourism, how you can increase the economic impact? Because you have more here than many cities. Um, and I think it's, um, it's a best kept secret, but personally think it should not be a secret and that we could all benefit if you would share with the rest of the country. Well, welcome to Cleveland. Yeah, we're, we're pretty knowledgeable that we're world class. Um, there is, though, the sensibility in this um, nation of cultural snobbery. And we're out there, I think, where's Jeremy? Jeremy's talking about it. But, you know, the studies, the economic development studies that have been done, um, whether it is regional, whether it is city, county, there are tons of studies. We know that, I think, um, Positively Cleveland, is that? No. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a couple years back. Um, has done lots. Can we do more? Yes. I mean, there's all a lot of creativity, I think, around that thought. Um, I had to grab the mic. Uh, you're absolutely right. Thank you for that question. It's a $9.1 billion industry, 65,000 jobs. And it, it's our job as a simile to really capture a lot of the data, but the partnerships with Destination Cleveland, with Greater Cleveland Partnership, um, are going to be critical to us making sure uh, Cleveland gets off the, you know, gets into the national limelight. I should point out, uh, if you all thought read Forbes magazine, recently they had an article, the headline was, will Cleveland be the next 
Venice. Have you seen that? And visual arts were a big part of, of that. So, so it's happening, but not nearly enough. It's, uh, the, the work of marketing is something that has to continue to happen constantly. But welcome to Cleveland. I so appreciate having you, Francis. Yeah, we're kind of in the same shape, I think, arts and culture, like, uh, is uh, Cleveland Clinic and our medical system is, is, you know, one of the top, if not in, you know, the U.S. and the world, but people still have a kind of hard time grasping that, so we, we're just going to be excellent, that's all. Let's continue to be excellent. Well, I uh, teach experientially I and mean, intergenerationally health in this building using the trees inside and outside the building, asking the students here the question, what can we learn about health from trees and forests? To go back to Mr. Johnson's comment, he, he, uh, in the beginning, he said, look at this nice weather we're having. Well, if we look around um, the world, a lot of people, including people on the coasts, are not having such great weather. And my question to you as leaders of the arts community here in world-class Cleveland, is what can we do to help our own communities and citizens learn about the huge challenges we face with our climate, our relationships to nature? What can we do to prevent us from joining, as a species, the sixth extinction which we have created? Seems to be art has an important role to play, in Cleveland particularly because of our meteorological and geological position, perhaps a special opportunity. I love the questions that we've had about nature and the connection with arts. Um, well, I, I think that um, that for a contemporary art organization like Front sort of happens organically because uh, artists of today are very interested in that subject. Um, this is the, you know, we see it happening all around us. Um, and, and I think, if anything, artists are ahead of the rest of us in, sort of, um, in, the, in their exploration of these kinds of challenges. I'll point to just one example. Uh, currently on view, uh, the uh, UK-based artist collective Cooking Sections has a uh, um, couple of fountains in North Coast Harbor, uh, not just because it looks cool, but to uh, um, bring attention to the issue of hypoxia, the fact that uh, fertilizer runoff into Lake Erie is causing algae blooms that pull all the oxygen out of the lake, uh, kill the wildlife. Um, so not only are those fountains aerating the lake in one small way, but it's the beginning of a three-year effort by uh, cooking sections to engage with farmers here in Northeast Ohio to draw attention to the changes that need to happen. Um, so yes, contemporary artists have a huge role um, uh, to take in drawing attention to the environment, and I believe that will be one of the major sort of um, uh, topics of discussion in contemporary art in the coming years. Add to that, uh, we talk a lot about sustainability at CIA, and it's obviously it's it's often um, the subject of a lot of the contextual pieces that a lot of our faculty and students create. But even the thinking about um, materials that are being used, or even teaching about sustainability and practice, whether it's through glass or through other material, or even even uh, paint. Um, and, and we have a great class in our design area about sustainability and design, but I think what's really, really interesting is how you teach uh, the opportunities to, to, to use, utilize arts and design to help solve sort of bigger civic problems, including these sort of wicked problems that are, that are facing all, all over. And I think that's oftentimes um, a huge opportunity is to look Look to artists and designers to help a lot of these solve, being part of the teams to solve a lot of these these larger issues because I think design and design thinking and, and it opens a whole new box of opportunity to, to be part of a collective team to, to solve bigger problems that are much larger than ourselves. We're, we're going to have the opportunity next year to work with at least two artists who are passionate about this topic, one of whom, Andrea Bowers, grew up in Northeast Ohio. Her father was a fisherman, and so her time spent on the lake was really important to her, and so she is actually an eco-activist. 
um, whose work uh, has long focused on water health and has been working with two advocacy and activist organizations out of Toledo. So we're going to be both showing her work and then partnering with those organizations to create uh, what are called democracy school programs for our teens that teach them about environmental activism around clean, fresh water in our lake, in our Great Lakes, um, also through the lens of working with artists. So for us, the lens in which we enter this is often through uh, working with artists who are passionate and who are active in this in this landscape. Um, and you know, increasingly, those artists being either from or based here in Northeast Ohio makes the work even more relevant to our community. I mean, I'll just say that uh, you know, historical art also can play a role here. Um, and we've been talking for some time now about an exhibition on climate change that would bring together works by uh, contemporary artists uh, with works uh, that were created um, by civilizations or in civilizations that. Uh, either perished or declined uh, due to um, the ways that they, that they exploited their environment. It was something we were talking about with the Museum of Natural History before we went into the pandemic, and it's probably a conversation we should resume. Um, and finally, I would say that sustainability, that's a word that didn't, it hasn't appeared in the CMA strategic plan until just this summer, and, um, and I'm proud that it's there. So I would just echo uh, Fred's thoughts there that, you know, occurring organically, but no, we, at the Akron Art Museum, we definitely, uh, you know, we have nothing uh, on the plans right now. We, we definitely should be addressing it, and we have these beautiful gardens that help to support it as well, but we need to take a, definitely more of an initiative and maybe be the leader in the Akron area. Hi, my name is Julie Patton, and I'm echoing the concerns about the environment because one of the things that artists in the community face has to do with city laws that govern um, people's houses and properties in relation to, um, let's just say, I, maybe the best way to say it is I ended up in a court hearing uh, concerning a conviction of an, uh, an artist. And so there are a lot of connections between um, mental health and the arts, a lot of creative people uh, who have um, neurological divergencies often relate to found objects in nature and scavenging. So it was disconcerting to hear the judge, although she was very compassionate uh, to the individual that was on trial, she still referred to it as trash. So people like me and other creative projects that have been rewilding um, nature in and around their properties and also creating uh, sculptures or all kinds of uh, visual contexts are under siege. So it would, if there's some way that you all can approach the city or any one in governance to rethink. For instance, it's people um, associated with the development company without permission of the owners goes around Glenville and cleans up uh, a lot of the creative projects that people have implemented. Um, casitas and all kinds of yard things need to be treated as creative interventions and as art instead of people being fined and then losing their houses or going to jail. For instance, a, a, a two to three hundred year old tree in front of the building that my project is located in, which is not my project, which is really an inheritance dating back to the 40s and there are collections in the building that go back that far and it was open, uh, featured in initial front triennial. Um, so anyway, there was a, a giant limb that fell. It was 50 inches in, di uh, in, um, in diameter. And the city, without any understanding of trees, most of the arborists that are working for tree companies, they're not dendrologists. They're not scientists. And um, so they demanded that the tree be taken down in five days or they would place a lien against the property. 
So it's very heavy-handed, um, and, and, and that's not really known or, or public. Um, uh, but anyway, so even though Holden and Botanical Garden said that the tree could be given time to heal and the other remaining uh, branch that had uh, included art uh, hanging over East Boulevard, if it was cut away, um, the tree could possibly be saved. So I think that's a great question, Ms. Pat. Um, do we have a reason? I just want to hate to interrupt. I don't want to interrupt. No, that's fine. I'm just thinking where art and nature and people's personal habitats come together and then also uh, how that is uh, often a healing refuge. And it's art. So this individual said, no, this is art. But the judge was demanded that it be cleaned up, etc. And so I went to look at it because I wasn't familiar with the case at all. And I'll get to you in a minute. And I could see how intentional I documented it. And I think one thing that's missing, um, we've talked a little teeny tiny about, it, is that um, the connection between arts and culture and city governments is missing, has been missing historically in Cleveland. So there is not, for instance, a lot of artist representation in the city. So you can go to some cities, I think someone mentioned um, Minneapolis, and these are cities that actually have artists that work with it, not just for murals or public art projects, but actually they work on policies and they work in, for instance, the you know working with the arborists or working on coming up with zoning laws. And that humanistic approach and environment and the balance between the two is something that I, I think, you know, and that's why Jeremy was, was gonna jump in. These are two things that um, some of us are working with the city. Mayor Bibb had committed to having um, cabinet level staff of an arts and culture person. So, you know, the secret is we'd love to have an office of arts and culture and have policies being developed so that we can have either artists embedded within city organizations or really have a much more tighter um, liaison situation of artists and creatives in the city that work with government. That's something that as, you know, we talked about the excellence of arts and culture in Cleveland, but right now that's not quite reaching City Hall. And I think that very strong partner with our organizations and our funders and our art service organizations and our public art, um, you know, tax that we have that funds our organizations. Um, to have the city at the table and the county, hopefully too, will make things that much stronger. So we're all kind of working for that, towards that. Do you know me? <laughs> Outsider artists, and, and, and also what they need to point someone that deals with their mental health. And mental health, and that's actually county. So, you know, that's why it's important that it's not just with City of Cleveland or probably City of Akron, but also the county because they are in charge of the mental health programs and also a lot of youth and juvenile justice programs. So, we're, you know. I, I think that's a wonderful segue for this afternoon. Let's take that, uh, we're going to have those community conversations we could dive in even deeper. Um, so I'm going to, we have time for one more question. I have a couple comments and then I'll turn it back over to Deirdre. Hey, thanks for those comments. Uh, my question is, is coming up in East Cleveland. And it seems that that bridge at 120 in Euclid wasn't, was identified in this room because no one mentioned East Cleveland. Um, and so I want to know, and of course, John, you're, you're, you know, you can maybe be excused out of this conversation unless you want to leapfrog over and show how to be better neighbors to these people. But for me, the question is, what are institutions doing about what has happened in East Cleveland and about the, the known $122 million that's coming into East Cleveland right now so we don't get erased? with this new, new development. So that's my question, because it's a serious thing about making sure our, our identity shows up in spaces when we have people who are, are excited about the culture of arts that are in Cleveland, 
and East Clevelanders are not excited about being ignored perpetually. And so that is what I would like to hear because as someone who's boomeranging back and has contributed to the demise of East Cleveland because of my contribution of brain drain leaving, I need us to all acknowledge what we've all done to the city of East Cleveland. Any other organizations that boundary are on the boundary? Thank you for that important question and that important focus. East Cleveland has been a community that we have worked with in the past and have actually endeavored through um, some support from the Cleveland Foundation to try and deepen relationships. I did a project in 2009 with Shaw High School students uh, working with an artist named Iona Rizzo Brown. It was our first opportunity to work with that high school, which had incredible students uh, that some of them continue to be engaged with MOCA in their adulthood, as well as faculty. And then in 2018, we um, created a writing residency and, just, and a plan to attempt to deepen our relationship in East Cleveland, working with Daniel Recontar and some of our internal team along in partnership with, at the time, Sheba Marcus Bay, who was the uh, director of the East Cleveland Library. Um, MOGA is an organization of a certain scale, and so we rely on partnerships. And unfortunately, Sheba departed the library uh, at the time that we were starting to kind of formalize that relationship, which is in 20, like 2018. It is a city that we are um, invested in becoming closer with, with residents and with the organizations that are there. Um, it is, I will say, uh, historically, what has been uh, an interesting conundrum that comes up in funding is uh, that many funders focus on CMSD and not on East Cleveland schools, and so in some cases we have had to make an argument for our work in that. Um, but I 100% agree, and I think that um, for us it's through community partnerships with, with organizations that already have trust uh, within East Cleveland, and I, uh, I'm committed to deepening that work on behalf of MOCA and with our team. We are right now looking to add a community engagement manager to our team, and this will be the lion's share of their focus. We'll be developing relationships with partners and leaders in East Cleveland, Glenville, Fairfax, Buckeye, St. Superior, St. Clair. This will be the focus of their work. I mean, I'll just say that, that uh, for the Cleveland Museum of Art, uh, too, I think the future is, is these kind of um, deep partnerships um, uh, with East Cleveland. And, and frankly, um, I, would, I would be really interested in knowing what your thoughts are about ways that we can uh, better serve East Cleveland um, at the museum. Um, I, I'd really welcome that. And if we have a chance to talk, I would, uh, I'd love to do that. So I'm your next door neighbor, and I um, um, feel personally and professionally responsible and invested in this moving forward. This has been an opportunity I, I haven't seen. I know most of the time I've been here, I've also been, it's been during COVID and a lot of our community out outreach efforts was, was not able to happen. But even right now, um, we are doing some restructuring even in our community outreach division uh, due to a departure. But one of the big priorities of mine is these, this is literally our backyard and we there's so much more we need to do and I too want to learn and understand first I don't want to impose myself upon when my institution upon this uh, wonderful community telling them what what I think you need so again I love perhaps this is something a greater university circle initiative that we could come together to mobilize um, and really impact change together especially starting with a really um, intentional listening process to learn more about what you need. I'm very interested in getting um, a big part of our students uh, learning that all of our students have to do engage practice projects. I'd love to work more with East Cleveland community members and organizations and businesses. Um, and I'm, I'm excited, um, I'm very excited, so I'd love to talk with you. I just wanted to add that um, Ismail did not introduce himself and I'm going to be properly introducing him later, but uh, he is the leader of Loiter East Cleveland and will be leading a community conversation. Uh, and I'll say more about that after Jeremy finishes his remarks. Let's hear it for this panel. Jennifer Coleman, moderator. Thank you all. This has been certainly thought-provoking and informational. I appreciate your time this morning. 
Here's what's going to happen now. I'm going to give you a few announcements. I'm going to turn it over to Deirdre, so of course, some final announcements. And where are you going next for lunch and for this afternoon? I do want to acknowledge and thank for the generous support for this session today, the George Gunn Foundation and the Terra Foundation for American Arts. We appreciate their support. Secondly, you have in front of you uh, some handouts you just received speaking about money investing in art, investing in arts and, and culture. We are very grateful that in Cuyahoga County, we are the recipient of $3.3 million in funding from uh, the county of Cuyahoga through Armin Budish and the county council. And you have an invitation to a public award ceremony to thank them for that $3.3 million. That's that blue, blue green piece of uh, paper that you received. That is free to members of Assembly for the Arts. The, the cost of membership is whatever you would like to be, <laughs> whatever you would like to give. Uh, and then you can come to that, that breakfast for free. Secondly, you also have a small card. That's how artists access the money. We literally have dollars that are available for individual artists and creative businesses. The deadline is September 30th. Go to that website, use your phone to scan that in. If you were earning money as an artist or creative before the pandemic and you lost dollars, you probably are eligible. Please do share that with your friends. And finally, Continuing to do this economic impact work is very important. Coming soon to a theater or a gallery or a museum, you will be asked to participate in an audience survey where we are capturing a lot of this information. Cleveland is participating with 300 other cities across the nation with Americans for the Arts. It's called AEP6. So please participate when you see a volunteer or staff or ask you to participate in those surveys. And finally, some more bookkeeping now from Deirdre. She could also tell us about parking, because many of you may have parked and they want to know how to fix that. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to thank you all so much for being here with us on this beautiful Saturday afternoon. Uh, thank all of our panelists. Um, it was an excellent conversation. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the second half of our day. Um, so we have lunch for everyone downstairs, so I encourage you to stay, have a bite to eat. Um, you're welcome to enjoy your lunch in the courtyard, or you can bring it back up here. Uh, and then following lunch, we have a slight change in, in our uh, agenda for the day. Um, so we'll, lunch will, will go on until about 12.45, uh, and then following that, I actually wanted to uh, bring our uh, community conversation speakers uh, back to this room to have a, a panel conversation. Uh, it, it occurred to me after speaking with uh, Ishmael, who um, is becoming a friend, uh, that it would be really powerful and impactful to bring these four black men leaders together uh, in much the same way that we're bringing these leaders together uh, before we break into deeper conversations. Um, some of our inspiration for today is thinking about power and access. Um, in this room, we have board members, we have museum directors, um, directors of art schools, we have arts administrators like myself, we have artists, we have people representing all facets of our arts ecosystem. And what's really special about Front is that it's a convener of all of these, all, all of these amazing institutions. And we're, we're really trying to think about how we can use our access, our privilege, to be better. Um, and so having these conversations with our, our directors has been wonderful. Um, but I also want to shift to looking at uh, leaders who are uh, transforming their neighborhoods to make Cleveland better. Uh, individuals like Ishmael who moved back to Cleveland to make East Cleveland better. Because who is going to do it? We have to do it. Uh, so, um, I encourage you to please stay and think about your role and how we can support and build together. Uh, so, following uh, lunch, lunch will go until about 12.45, um, we'll have a brief panel discussion, so we'll have uh, Ishmael, David, uh, Antoine, and um, 
What am I missing? Well, Walter. Thank you, and Walter, who I haven't seen yet, uh, would come back into this room for a brief conversation, and then um, we will break out into uh, smaller groups uh, at 1.30 uh, before returning to this room for a wrap-up uh, wrap up remarks from, from Jeremy. Uh, so, a couple housekeeping items. Uh, when you exit this room, we have the men's room to the left, the women's room uh, to the right. Um, and then, as, as was mentioned, I have parking validation. So before you leave today, um, please help yourself. There's a blue sheet on the end of this table. You can just grab one of those and uh, you swipe that at the parking garage exit. Uh, there's a barcode, you, you swipe the barcode for the blue card, then your white card, and then you'll be able to exit uh, the garage. Um, but again, uh, I encourage you all to um, think about um, sticking around for the second half because uh, these amazing four black men uh, who are leaders transforming some of Cleveland's most impoverished and forgotten East Side communities, um, we need to have conversations about that. And, and that's what, uh, you know, when we think about Front's exhibition theme, art as a form of healing and transformation, this is where healing begins, having difficult and powerful conversations. So uh, thank you again for joining us. Enjoy lunch. Uh, we will be downstairs on a lower level. Is, is uh, Susan still here? Yes, I'm just going back down. Okay, so uh, please stick around for lunch and we will see you uh, back in this room at 1245. Thank you.